Hi, can everyone hear, hear us? Yes, loud and clear. Thank you, Thank Otis. you, Otis. We're gonna start in one minute. Our speakers today, their bios are in Eventbrite. We'll also post them in the chat, but we really wanna get started with the curated content. And good morning, everyone. I'm on the owl, so I don't know how you can see me, but hopefully you can see or hear me um, like the person talking from the sky. My name is Chandra Tettleton. I am Director of Project Management for our Strategic Neighborhood Development Team that cultivates a lot of the economic development districts. And we're really excited this quarter to feature a topic that I was just telling our panel experts. We hear on a day-to-day -day basis businesses, community advocates, and economic development districts really inquiring about how to go about the supporting of a potential change of an old gas station or a change of a runoff area. And we're really able to pull these experts together to talk about not only what is a brownfield, but how do you start the process of even trying to understand if you're eligible to support brownfield development within your community, what qualifies as a brownfield, and for the metrics people in the room, and for the grants that are due, how do you measure the success of the, ground, the brownfield? And so really excited to have a great panel. Otis, we are featuring you today prominently, but we're going to change that slide <laughs> and start it. <laughs> but your, 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 your picture looks amazing. But we have Carrie, I'm going to butcher your last name, Gotcha. Gotcha. Carrie, um, an MS and is a principal urban planner, Brown Fitz manager for the City of New Orleans Planning Commission. We have Scott Nightingale, who is a TAB service. He will tell you what the technical assistance is, but the TAB service coordinator with Kansas State University. And I also tag it as our, our EPA rep ish. You. <laughs> Our, our federal governmental lens, and then Adam Tatar, yeah. yay, uh, manages the Brownfield Redevelopment Program for the Regional Planning Commission and services over eight parishes. So without further ado, we told you why this was prevalent to have or an important reason to have. This recording will be uh, available through YouTube. So if you have any colleagues that weren't able to attend in person in real time, or if you want to go back and reference some of the material that is covered this morning, please feel free to do so. It'll be on NOLBA's YouTube, and I will send out the link through those at Eventbrite registered, as well as the stakeholder list that um, we email this information to. To start this bubbly Wednesday morning off, <laughs> I feel like I'm talking to the audience of all. So to start this <laughs> bubbly morning off, we're gonna have Scott Nightingale really cover the ins and outs and overview of what is a brownfield. Thank you, Chandra. You're welcome, Scott. <laughs> okay, um, as Chandra mentioned, my name is Scott Nightingale. I'm with the Kansas State University Technical Assistance to Brownfields Program. We uh, work under an EPA agreement uh, to help communities with their brownfields redevelopment. So let's start by talking about what a brownfield is. Now, EPA defines it as real property, uh, the expansion, redevelopment, or reuse of which may be complicated by the presence or potential presence of a hazardous substance, pollutant, or contaminant. Uh, boring definition, but I wanted to put that up there. Um, there's a few things to consider. Uh, EPA, actually, this is a pretty broad definition they have of what a brownfield is. Um, as you notice, it's not just something that's contaminated. It's something that might potentially be contaminated. You know, we're talking about properties that are sitting there not being developed because there is a problem or there might be a problem and people are kind of scared off from them. Now, Go back in history a little. We aren't going to spend a lot of time uh, going through EPA uh, law, but you know, back in the 70s, early 80s, uh, EPA got some bills passed to set up folks to be responsible for cleaning up properties that had contamination. And that was great. Uh, but within that, it's the CERCLA program. They ended up having it so landowners were responsible. Well, 
that unfortunately made it so nobody wanted to become the landowner of a property that was contaminated. So that led to the brownfields loss, which set up a way, mechanism was put in place that folks could obtain contaminated property, but not be liable for the contamination. And that then allowed for redevelopment of these properties that were otherwise sitting with nothing going on. Now, a lot of folks think of brownfields as sites with contamination in the media, in the soil, in the groundwater. Uh, things we all are familiar with, gas stations, dry cleaners, manufacturing facilities, anything that's had a release that has impacted soil or the water, and it's, it's there, and it's a problem, it might be a health risk, it's a very, at the very minimum, contamination. But sometimes people overlook that brownfields also include building materials, asbestos, lead-based paint, uh, things associated with the building. Um, you see on this list, animal waste. They, they've used brownfield money to clean up pigeon poo at sites. You know, things that are hazardous. Again, it's a broad definition of materials or contaminants that can be used. All right, so why even bother taking care of these brownfield sites? Well, there's some benefits to reusing these. Um, Often, it's, it's much less expensive than breaking ground somewhere new. Um, you know, the properties are there, they're not being used. You can often get them for a reduced cost. Um, existing infrastructure is already there. The utilities will be there. The roadways getting to, you know, your site will already be there. And, you know, if it was a business before, um, the corner gas station, it was there because that was a great location. And so a lot of brownfields locations are desirable. And there are also, in many communities, possibilities for local tax incentives or other development incentives for taking care of brownfield sites. All right, this is kind of a, a quick look at the steps needed to redevelop brownfields. You know, there's something I didn't say ahead of time. Uh, I see that there's a, a note in the chat Please, if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to put something in the chat. Chandra and Valerie are watching that for us. So if there's something, just jump right in and uh, we'll address it as those questions come up. And one of the things they asked about, what about mold? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, mold is something that can be looked at, but usually um, EPA considers that only in conjunction with other problems. For instance, if you have a building that has asbestos, or lead-based paint, um, other hazardous things, they will also be able in the Brownfields program to address black mold uh, or mold problems. Uh, the most recent determination we've got from region six on this, and that's the EPA region that, that serves Louisiana, is that for mold being the only problem, they won't take care of it by itself. But if it comes with other hazards, they will address it. Okay, um, back to kind of the steps of brownfields redevelopment. And these are not steps in that you do one, then move to two, then to three. They all kind of work together and you bounce back and forth, but you need all these things. Um, from a community perspective, you want to redevelop properties that are gonna meet the goals and the visions of the community. You know, there's no need having something redeveloped that's not going to work. Uh, so that's kind of the first. You want to make sure you're meeting the needs of the community. Uh, other steps in here, identifying the brownfields, prioritizing them, doing the assessments, finding funding, uh, cleaning up, and getting it back in use. Okay, my clicker stopped on me. Could you go next, please? All right. One of the things I want to talk about um, Chandra asked for this was things to look at when you're prioritizing which brownfields to address. You know, you all probably know of a bunch of different sites that, that would qualify as brownfields. Things to consider when you're deciding which ones to attack first uh, could include the economic benefit that you get from a property. It could be health related. If you actually have some properties that are, you know, adversely affecting community health, Definitely get those taken care of. Sometimes folks will like to go after a certain corridor 
uh, and redevelop a whole corridor so you can sort things by geographic area. Another way to look at it, if you know available funding for certain projects, well, then by golly, get out there and uh, get those projects moved forward so you can get the funding to, to move on through. All right. There are lots of different people out there that can help you with your brownfields redevelopment. You're going to hear later from Adam and Carrie. They are some of your local folks. And honestly, I always recommend you start locally and then expand as you're asking for assistance. Um, I've included the websites here for the Louisiana Department of Environmental Quality Program, a very strong state program. Um, we get to work with multiple states and Louisiana has one of the best programs you'll find. They can help you do assessments. Uh, they can help you do cleanups. They, they're a fantastic resource. Also, I put on the uh, EPA uh, website there, a um, lot of good information. And, and as related to funding, um, just to mention here, and, and Brownfields is, you know, it's that intersection of environmental cleanup and, you know, economic development. So you bring in all of these other federal funding programs. Some of these come through the state, some are directly federal. Um, we won't list them all, but with the infrastructure law money and the Inflation Reduction Act money that's coming out right now, lots of opportunities for funding. And then of course, there's, there's us, uh, technical assistance to Brownfield at Kansas State. Um, we're fortunate to have Louisiana as one of the states we cover. Um, Bunch of different services. You can look at these later. Um, but if you have any kind of issues, just get a hold of us. Our services are free. And we work with all the local folks, state folks, in a coordinated effort to help you out. All right. Any other questions for me before we hand this over? All right. Um, next, going to hear from Adam Tatar, RPC. Thank you. Are we clicking? Is clicking happening? Uh, oh, perfect. Okay, great. All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Adam Tatar. I'm the uh, Brownfield Coordinator for the Regional Planning Commission. I'm going to talk a little bit today about the, the RPC and our Brownfield program at the RPC. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about the money and how to get it. I think that's what everybody's waiting for. And, I, and I'll wrap up a little bit about it. But in my experience, um, makes a brownfield redevelopment uh, successful. So first, uh, Shonner did ask me to talk a bit about the RPC, and I think that is a great place to start because even if um, you never get into brownfields after this talk, at the RPC, we do so many different things that it's great for folks in our area to just know that we're there and have a broad idea of what we do because if we can't help you with brownfields, we may be able to help with something else. And so in every metro area of the country, whether it's New Orleans, Baton Rouge, San Diego, Hoboken, New Jersey, there is an RPC. And the primary function is to do what we call long range transportation planning. So when you go to a gas station, you put gas in your car, you pay a tax. That goes to Washington, DC. All that money from DC comes back down to your metropolitan area to pay for widening the I 10, replacing the UEP Long Bridge, buying new buses for the RTA, putting new streetcar tracks in Canal Street. And it's your regional planning commissions that say, We have this much money, we have this many needs. How do we take our federal transportation money and program it over the next 20, 30 years for these big transportation projects? That's the core, core nuts and bolts of what we do. So of course, one would say, well, what does that have to do with brownfields? Well, some folks in their wisdom realized when these RPCs began to spring up in the 70s and 80s around the country that, you know, there's really an advantage to looking at our communities not just as the city or the town, but looking at things in kind of a regional perspective, because, you know, New Orleans doesn't exist in a vacuum. You know, we really, you know, there's a lot of back and forth with the suburbs across the river to our industrial areas in the West Bank, suburbs in the North Shore. So there's an advantage to thinking about things regionally. And on top of that, in order to perform the core function of this 
technical transportation planning, the RPCs have a really technically trained staff on board that had a lot of data analysis skills, had a lot of uh, analytical skills. So the regional planning commissions became an ideal place to locate lots of other programs that we could use to support our communities. Right now, we're doing things like helping um, introduce broadband into our rural communities. We help our communities with land use planning if they don't have those resources. We're helping put uh, electric vehicle charging stations out further out from the city. And so among the many services that we can now offer to the communities in our region, uh, we also offer a brownfield program. That is the program that I oversee. So I apply for brownfield grants uh, on behalf of our region. Even when we get those awards, I administer those awards to help support brownfield redevelopment in the various communities that RPC serves. And so we do serve the eight par parish metro regions. So we do Orleans, St. Bernard, Jefferson, Plaquemines, St. Tammany, Tangipahoa, St. John, St. Charles, depending on which program the kind of boundaries to be a little bit different. So we serve kind of a, a, a big area. So that is just a, a quick overview of what we do at the RPC. If you are working on anything that you think we may be able to assist with, we are always happy to hop on the phone, answer an email, and if we can help you, we probably know somebody who can, and we can always point you in the right direction. We, we really exist uh, as a service to all of the communities in our region. So with that, let's get into Brownfield specifically. Now, I hate to break it to you, but oftentimes Brownfields, every day is not an exciting party ribbon cutting day. No. Uh, <laughs> oftentimes a regular day in the life of Brownfields can sometimes just be on a big mound of dirt, in an open field, uh, in a really broken down building that no one has been into a very long time. Uh, so this is in St. Bernard Parish. This is actually a landfill where we were performing an environmental assessment uh, for the property owner who was getting ready to want to sell the property, put it back into commerce. It's an old landfill. And a lot of folks think they think brownfields, they think cleanup. Why are we just assessing this property? Now, what's the, There's no, no fun in assessment. We're just like looking, making reports. Here's the thing. If you go buy a house, what's the first thing you're going to do? You're going to get it inspected, right? Costs you a few hundred bucks, but now you know what's going on in this house before you sink all your money into it. I'll tell you what, an inspection on an old landfill costs a lot more than $100. So if you are interested, if you're a, a business owner and you are interested in locating your business to an old property like this, for somebody to go ahead and pay for the inspection on the front end for you, to go do that due diligence for you and give you a grant funded report with everything we know about the property as an investor that really mitigates your risk and now you have a clearer picture of what this property is and you can go into a negotiation with the owner with a much better sense of what's going on with this property so you can negotiate a fair price if you are interested and you go well before i buy this property I got to pay $30,000 just to assess it. You're just going to walk away. Brownfields will help you pay for that assessment on the front end, really mitigating some of the risk for the developer, making it much more attractive to them. So that's what a phase one assessment does. And, and that's what we are, we're doing here with our environmental team. They're going to go survey, take pictures, make observations, and come up with a report at the end of that. Um, so beyond a phase one assessment, something a little more tangible, uh, this project was over in West Wego. Uh, this was uh, an old, it was, uh, this was only a few weeks ago, but back in the 60s, this property was a gas station at one point. Owner wanted to sell it. Whenever a prospective buyer would come along to look at the property, they would notice Old gas station, what do gas stations have in the ground? They have petroleum tanks in the ground. Anybody who was interested would just walk away. It's too much risk. It's too much uncertainty. And then the guy could not sell the property. Therefore, it could not be put back into reuse um, for the community, which is, you know, it was just kind of sitting there. What Brownfield was able to do 
was go in and uh, it's kind of hard to see those that big muddy mound are actually uh, petroleum tanks that we pulled out of the ground and were hauling away. The tanks had already been uh, closed and sealed. We were now pulling them out of the ground. Uh, we would then go test the soil under where the tanks were to ensure there was no residual contamination, which there wasn't. But once these tanks were out, um, this property received kind of a clean bill of health from uh, the, the state DEQ, and now it is in a much it's a much more attractive property to a prospective purchaser. So we, we informally call these a tank gang. Uh, it's, it's a nice afternoon to go watch these big ugly things come out of the ground. And if you're a neighbor, hey, two less petroleum tanks in your neighborhood, you know, makes everybody feel good. Well, these two examples are kind of more of our everyday brownfield projects, but every once in a while, you know, we do have really spectacular projects that kind of blow everybody out of the water and make everybody uh, really excited about the work that we've been doing. And not that these aren't fun, but uh, one you may be familiar with is here in New Orleans in the Lower Ninth Ward, which was the former McDonough School, uh, which is now the Tate Etienne Prevost Center on St. Claude. If you're not familiar, school was shuttered uh, after Katrina. Uh, and then there was a spectacular vision from the community and a lot of folks were very connected to that school to reimagine it as uh, community housing, community center, and possibly a museum focusing on civil rights and integration in the Deep South. And so after a very long process involving many partners, including Brownfield funding, there was a really wonderful ribbon cutting. I think this was earlier this year to, um, you know, the school had been completely rehabilitated. Um, assessments, lead-based paint, asbestos, and a complete renovation. And now that's by the TEP Center is, is open and operational. So, you know, oftentimes it's putting things in the dirt, sampling the dirt, pulling tanks out of the ground, but every once in a while, you know, we work on these really spectacular projects. And, you know, we call this, that kind of segues into my, my last slide. Oh, it does. Yeah. Okay. I'm getting, I'm getting myself ahead of myself. Great project. We'll, we'll come back to this project in a minute. So this is, if you, again, it's over in the lower ninth ward. Definitely worth a drive by if you haven't seen it yet. And I will come back to this in a second. And we have some of the members, one of the members, yep. uh, Ms. Leona Sage, is on oh, SNM Development. Hey, of course. Some of our board members are here today for that. Oh, yeah. excellent. With, yeah. Perfect, perfect. Um, yeah, that was so much fun to work, to work with. It was great to meet uh, Ms. Leona as well. Um, so I think what everybody is waiting for uh, is show me the money. How do I get this, this funding or how do we access this or, or what are some next steps? The simple answer to this question is uh, you have brownfield resources around you, myself, Scott and Carrie. If you have any questions, interest, thoughts about brownfields in your community, uh, we could go through, we could talk for an hour about every grant, every program, funding source available to you. I don't think it's in y'all's best interest this morning to go through every grant minutia of it. Here's the thing. Reach out to one of us. Pitch us what's on your mind in your community about brownfields. Do you have a site? Do you have a project, an idea, just a question, a district, an industrial corridor? Based on what you're thinking, we can then guide you to the appropriate funding source because there is money out there. There's a good bit of money out there, especially with um, the president's infrastructure legislation. It's just a matter of lining you and your community up with the funding source that's going to kind of point you in the right direction. And we are more than happy to talk with you about that. Um, Scott's team will even help you know, review grant applications if you all want to do something like that. But there's already money that's currently you know, accessible. Contact one of us, give us a quick blurb, even if you don't even know what you're talking about. There's no stupid questions. What are you thinking? What do you think you need money for? And we'll help point you in the right direction. Yeah, there's no point in going through every single grant right now. But just know uh, there is money out there for your grant for brownfield projects. And lastly, uh, Chandra wanted me to talk a bit about what makes, in my opinion, a successful brownfield project. Um, we call the McDonough site, you know, a brownfield redevelopment. You know, but the thing is, 
to get something from where it was to where it is now requires a huge amount of collaboration with uh, you know, many, many partners across um, the government, the private, the nonprofit sector. And if I had to give you know, one comment of what makes a successful brownfield, it is a really broad partnership. So yeah, you have your local brownfield program, but of course you have your community partners who are really championing and you know, really driving that project. You have the private developers, you have our, our state economic, our, uh, environmental folks, you have the federal environmental folks, economic development, local uh, government, you know, the city of New Orleans contributed a lot of money to this project, the nonprofit partners, uh, the, philanthrop the philanthropists as well. All of these had to come together. And at the end of the day, you know, Brownfields, we were one sliver of many slivers that helped uh, make this project a reality. So a broad partnership, I think, is what is necessary to, to bring a project to completion. Uh, and I think that's all I have. Thank you all for your time. And like I said, let us know if you have questions or ideas and we will help you uh, find the money for your projects. I know that if you all want to know the angle that you're being featured at, this is a good angle. Okay. And then people are kind of looking. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> I know that, so for the last speaker. But... Also, uh, somebody just put something in the chat and say contact information. So we'll, we'll make sure that we get that. Keisha, thank you for that. We'll make sure that uh, Chandra will, will get some contact information out to the speakers. Thank you. Okay. Great. Hi, good morning. My name is Gary Hanshaw. Um, I'm a principal planner and Brownfield manager for the city of New Orleans um, Planning Commission. And um, I'm really happy to be here today. I wanted to give you a little bit of an update on what's going on with the Brownfield School at the city. Um, the city has not had a Brownfields program in a number of years. Um, through the infrastructure bill, <clears throat> we were able to um, reinvigorate the Brownfield program, started again. It's been active for about a year now. And we're really focusing on capacity and trying to um, provide as much support as possible for the projects um, in Orleans Parish. Next slide, please. It's got a little delay, so okay. I'm actually, it shouldn't work. Okay, thank you. Um, Adam and Scott both pointed out a couple of different um, brownfields that they've been working on. Um, and what defines a brownfield. Um, here's a brownfield site that is very popular um, and very well known here in New Orleans. This is the Market Street Power Plant. Um, it is currently under renovation and is part of the River District um, that is going to create a new neighborhood right next to the Mississippi River between the Convention Center and the Market Street Power Plant. Um, this was the sole power plant that, um, that energized New Orleans until the 70s. It was defunct after Katrina. It was a club for a small amount of time, and now it's coming back into fruition. I don't know exactly what the plan is for the Market Street Power Plant, but they are have gone through the process of assessment and revitalization or <clears throat> assessment and cleanup, and now they're moving forward into renovation. So along with that, um, between the, the Market Street Power Plant and the Convention Center are a number of parcels. We were able to work with the LDEQ to assess those parcels in a block so they can move forward with the cleanup activity and the renovation of those sites. That was completely done by the LDEQ with support of the Brownfields program at the City Planning Commission, and they're now moving forward into renovation. Next slide, please. Um, we were also able to um, apply for and accept a $2 million EPA cleanup grant award in 2023 for the Naval Support Activity Center or the NSA building. The NSA building has been also defunct since 2005 and has become an eyesore and a place where vagrancy, crime um, in the um, Lower Ninth Ward and the Bywater areas. It's located directly across from Bacchanal. 
um, and it, it's surrounded by residential <clears throat> area. The, the um, Edison building has been contaminated. It also has a, um, <clears throat> a former gas station that is in the process of being um, assessed and the $2 million cleanup grant will help with all of the cleanup activity that's needed to provide the developers with the movement forward for 295 affordable housing units along with the grocery store in a food desert area. Um, solar panel will be provided for the top of the um, rooftops as well, so it'll also include alternate energies. Um, everyone knows this site, this is the fly. Um, it was formerly a landfill site, and now it's used for recreational activities. Um, it's very highly populated with students and residents of New Orleans, and it's definitely an example of an amazing transformation from a brownfield to a greenfield here in New Orleans. Um, these are just a few indicators um, coming from the EPA of economic success um, nationwide. The dollars leveraged, um, the jobs that were leveraged in 2021, directly coming from the Brownfield um, Infrastructure Bill dollars. And just an example of what um, these funds can provide uh, when used properly. And that's all, Chandra will um, let you know all the contact information and anything else you might need. Thank you. Thank you. I have closing remarks here, but I also have some thoughts. There's no question that not correct and you don't know until you ask so i have this little closing remarks and also additional questions for the panel so if people have any additional questions please feel free to place them in the chat you can also email we'll send out the contacts as well but my question one is <laughs> if i am trying to remediate or address a brownfield site say it was formerly a uh, gas station in the 1950s it's sitting there and I want to turn it into a dry cleaner and I know the chemicals long story short my grandfather also has had a, a dry cleaner and his dry cleaner period and the chemicals he used versus what is allowed now it's a little bit different your clothes don't starch as tight but they're a little bit healthier for you to breathe when you're wearing them so is that a positive potential um, investment if it, it could be also a potential brownfield 30 years later? Yeah. I, Is that a trick question? Like, no, no, it's a question. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I uh, think that'll be a problem. Yeah, the, uh, the future use of the property can be something that might cause contamination later. Uh, you mentioned, you know, a former gas station. There will not be funding through the Brownfields program to take a contaminated gas station and turn it into another gas station. That's not something that's going to happen. But, you know, um, the idea is, you know, the, the chemicals used, the, the regulations on handling contaminants now. Some of these places could go in you know, there could be a new dry cleaner and hopefully there would never be any releases of contaminants. That's not, you know, it's not uh, banned from having a dry cleaner go into something. Yeah, uh, so what EPA wants to see uh, out of its brownfield funding is it is properties being put back into productive reuse. So a, a new functioning dry cleaner is, you know, it's providing a service to the community, it's creating a job, it's generating tax revenue. Uh, so that's what we want to see. You know, the types of projects that EPA does not want to see. Gen generally, for instance, single family housing, it is not something, you know, if, if, a, if a property is going to be redeveloped for single family housing, generally not eligible for a brownfield funding. But, you know, we want to see something that's going to be good for the community. You know, I, I think if we're saying, you know, we're building a casino, EPA may raise their eyebrow at you and, and may not, you know, fly, but, you know, green space, affordable housing, you know, community services, industrial uses, commercial uses, uh, anything that's putting properties back into a productive use are, is generally going to be a really good use of brownfield funding. 
And here's a good example too for the $2 million NSA grant that we applied for. Um, the EPA is definitely looking at what that transition will be. So showing 295 affordable units in an area that really needs affordable housing, along with a grocery store in an area that's a food desert. Those are things that are really attractive to the EPA because they want to see these structures that have been defunct, that are filled with contaminants, then um, used for a better service to serve the community. Definitely. And Adam mentioned green space. And Carrie, you had a picture of a park. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't have to be economically based. Right, right. You know, if it's if it's beneficial to the community, that's yeah. you know, that's sufficient. And I would say the fly is used so regularly yeah. for all kinds of activities in an area that didn't really have a park right next to the Mississippi River. And they, they did a lot of work on that park. And I think it's been a really, really good example of a successful brownfield to greenfield transformation. And I'll have to say that there is also Brownfields Brightfields, which is the newest um, situation that the EPA is offering um, potential funding for in the future, which is taking spaces that are contaminated on um, brownfield spaces and then using them for alternative energy, especially solar arrays. So that's a way you can cap um, the, land, uh, the landfill or contaminated space if you need to, not penetrate the soil with the solar arrays, and then provide alternative energy uses as well. And that's a big piece of solar or alternative energy supply in a city where our infrastructure is elevating, but we need multiple access points and potential sourcing of energy to sustain, especially as we are in the season that we're in, that we will we'll remain nameless. <laughs> and to be able to capture that energy, store it for post-disaster recovery efforts here in Louisiana. I think it's, it's a really great program. And there's one site in Orleans Parish, Lord and Plaza site, um, that is, is a super fun site for the EPA, but they are planning um, 40 acres of solar. So that will be the first solar array in the city of New Orleans. I have a question in the chat. And there's also a question in my head. Um, and then I'll go to a question in the chat in my head. Has the Brownfield ever fully funded a single project or is it limited to specific scopes, i.e. site mitigation? Yeah. I think you touched on it really well. Yeah. Like the Brownfield is a, is a tiny sliver in, in the stack of financial and economic development of the project. Right. So I guess it's important not to get the definitions confused. So there's a Brownfield, you would call it a Brownfield site, which it could be any old abandoned building, industrial site. Oh, that's a brownfield site. There are brownfield grants. And what does the brownfield grant pay for? They only pay for, you know, assessing the contamination at the site uh, and doing the cleanup, the remediation. A brownfield grant doesn't go past that point. So really the brownfield grants pay for that front end environmental work. And then it's off to, you know, your, your other capital sources to actually do the redevelopment. So a brownfield grant does not pay for any you know, redevelopment, remodeling, building, anything like that. So. But does the federal government have additional funding? Once you get to that assessment period, you're clear that that's a project you want to take on. Maybe match, like EDA does kind of some match funding or, you know, the Department of Environmental Policy probably wouldn't be that person you go to, but maybe a potential USDA partner grant to support the development. Yeah. Yeah, there's, and as was mentioned, you know, with the with the new, with the Inflation Reduction Act money, with uh, the BIL money, there's a lot of funding coming through EDA, USDA Rural Development, um, different programs that can carry on the development once you get past what the Brownfield program can do. You know, and Adam mentioned assessment and cleanup. Assessment actually includes some things people aren't always aware of. That includes, um, from EPA's perspective, they'll fund uh, planning activities. Uh, you know, one of the things we get asked to come help with are our community meetings. Uh, you know, he mentioned, you know, having the community kind of get together and, and you know generate ideas for reuse. Um, and so, you know, um, the planning component goes into that too for the future use. Now, if you can tailor that with, you know, the ideas of the develop developer already coming in, that could help with the, some of the early steps of that. So I could have, as a community, not a resident, if I was a resident, they wanted to redevelop for 
private use a gas station, this money would be eligible to me. But if I was an economic development district, a merchant association, a community organization, nonprofit that sees the potential site or could be the potential for my business incubator site, I could potentially not piecemeal, but collectively co coalesce funding through grants to complete the project. But the ideal space would be to have some capital to support of like financing from the organization or other funding or that that community, that whole kind of group to make a successful brownfield that you show Adam. Yeah. Uh my expertise doesn't doesn't extend too far beyond brownfields, you know. So we, you know, if we want to use the McDonough School site as an example, the you know the they, they call the capital stack, the layers of funding that made that project a reality. Um, so you know, brownfields was a small piece of it, but there's also you know private capital, and there was just grants made you know, by this you know grants made by EDA or gifts from the city because the project was so special. Um, and then donations from from uh, philanthropy and such. So, yeah, I don't, you know, and I'm speaking kind of beyond my level of expertise. You know, I don't know that a project redevelopment can be fully grant funded. Could happen, um, but yeah, I, I guess it's really a, kind of on a, on a case by case basis. We would help connect you to other folks to answer your. I mean, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> Unfortunately, as far as the brownfield activity on a project, there could be grants that would cover the assessment, RLF, potentially grant loan combos that would cover the remediation of the site, all the way to you get to you know the letter, no more interest needed by the EPA. So it would cover the, the brownfield portion, but as far as the entire project, the, like the build out of yeah. the project, well, not, not, not all of it, not something the brownfield site. Right, right. And I'm sorry, was that answering Otis's question? Yes. Okay. Yes, that was Otis's question. And that was my third thought question of is there any possibility for this to be funded? But there's other funds that people can solicit for capital support of, of previous brownfield. But brownfield can lower the initial cost of what it would take to sure. actually build or you get to a certain point. And I think it's a great in New Orleans and being in what we call Cancer Alley. I think it's a great benefit to have any land assessed sure. just to know where, and I know that cost, sometimes it's cost prohibitive, but this is a great start that you can have other funding and potential partnerships because of the project, which is what I've heard you say, Adam, through the, the test center. And I was just like, yes, he understood. <laughs> <laughs> so capital outlay can support some state funding. There's a lot of dollars that people utilize, but just being able to start somewhere, I think is great. And the brownfield funds can also open up other sources of funding. So the NSA building, for example, um, has a huge pot of funding that was able to open up because the brownfield portion, it was contingent upon remediation of the site. So now the $2 million grant has come in, has opened up a $34 million HUD loan for the project. So it definitely can be very instrumental um, in making projects successful. I'm just scrolling through the slides as you reference points. It's the NSA building. And I've got reading to say something. Well, I think I think an example, a uh, good example of where Brownfield's funding kind of stops is uh, if you're cleaning up a building, uh, say it has asbestos, um, you know, Brownfields will fund the abatement of the asbestos, but it wouldn't fund the demolition of the building. It's, it's specific to the hazards. So there are things, you know, beyond Brownfield's plan. So if I'm a business owner and I want to open up a space that allows for um, the community to come for free to kind of a mini fly, for example, and but I have a restaurant that will also be partaking in this potential waterfront that is now wastewater runoff. Would I qualify for certain parts if I have community or would I have to have a nonprofit oversee the DEA part of that shared space versus my restaurant, but I'm benefiting from it by being addressed and the wastewater runoff. Good. 
I know I'm doing all these trick questions. No, no, like, no. The what ifs are no, always no, going through my head. I understand your question. So you want to buy a piece of property to use in order for a green space or for a restaurant? For a restaurant that has green space that's open to the community. Okay, sure. So I mean, basically what happened is you identify, I mean, it could be anything, any restaurant, and you go, oh, I want to I want to buy this. And if mm -hmm. you're right, I'm here with finance it most likely. The bank is going to say, okay, before you finance it, you've got to do your inspection, your due diligence, because the bank's not going to give you a loan for a property that doesn't know what's on that property. Brownfield's first thing is going to pay for that due diligence for you on that site. So before you buy it, you're going to get a report from Brownfield saying, here is everything we could find about this property. Everything it used to be, everything it is, every report, every old Sanborn map from the 19th. Everything. Here you go. And in that report, it's going to say, you know, buried, it's going to be one, it's going to be a thousand page report. Buried in there is going to be one paragraph that you need. It's either and you say, all will help me decipher yeah, the report. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Buried in there is going to be the conclusion. It's either going to say, hey, we have no reason to believe there is any environmental concern here. Go forth and conquer. Or it's going to say, hey, we looked at some records. This site has kind of a shady history. You're going to want to, we think there may be some contamination. Uh, so before you start having kids out here, serving food out here, you're going to want to go and do sampling of the ground, the soil, the building, the air to ensure there is no contamination. Or if there is, you want to know what it is. So you can kind of confirm what is actually going on on this site. Brownfields will pay for that. Then that report is going to come back, 2,000 pages, buried in there. It's going to say, hey, you know what? We tested everything. We found nothing. Go forth and conquer. And you are going to help me read yes. that 2,000 page report? Yes. Okay. But Or it's going to say, okay, we got some, we got some concern. We have some problems. And now we know specifically what they are and where they are. We're going to need to move into remediation. And then we need to help you identify funding sources to do the actual cleanup. When you go through all of that, then you get that clean bill of health from the state that says your property is, is clean. Okay, one quick question, and then I'll go to the chat question. If I've already purchased the property, mm -hmm. will you all still come in and do that brownfield assessment support and remediation? Depend. It's more difficult because uh, it depends. So do you know if they, was any due diligence done on the property? before it was purchased. I thought, say, I thought the water was clean, but it, it didn't right. turn to color one day. Here's okay. <laughs> okay. Listen, this is, here's the most important thing y'all can take from this because this happens all the time. The father, daughter, mom and pop, whatever, they, they find a good deal on a piece of similar, similar, can I this property for nothing? Man, or they want to donate it to us. Wow. We're going to buy, they're going to get this piece of property. We are getting a deal on it. They find out it used to be a gas station. There's tanks in the ground. Who's responsible for that tank now? It is that, you know, mom, you know, father, son, who unknowingly took ownership of this property. And now they are stuck with uh, an old gas station they didn't know. Um, unfortunately, not knowing the condition of the property before you buy it is not always an excuse because EPA may, and I guess we really have to talk, you know, kind of site by site. And so every case is very unique. Mm -hmm. But the short answer is if you own the property and uh, you did not do due diligence beforehand, EPA may consider you what they call a potentially liable party, which limits your accessibility to Brownfield grant funding to address it. Uh, again, we have to look at each site kind of on a real case by case basis. The moral of the story is don't accept free property, don't buy industrial property, commercial property without doing a phase one assessment first because you will be on the hook for whatever is in the ground. But if my grandfather, I'm in the LLC with my family. Mm -hmm. And my grandfather, who's deceased, purchased the property and in the it. 40s and 50s mm -hmm. when these were 
allocated chemicals that were approved. Right, right. And right. then now I am in 2023. Right. Trying to address them, but there were the 19, the 1970s or 1980s <laughs> is when things started to be regulated a little bit more. And then my particulate per what million of the droplets, they're starting to be even more because of the compounding of contaminants around me that right. didn't exist when I had trees and less right. industrial spaces in that property in the 1950s. Can I not be, can my grandfather rest his soul be liable even though, or not liable because it didn't exist and then I can still work with you all. The requirements to do your your appropriate empire, you know, your due diligence, those didn't come about, you know, that long ago. And so for entities that have owned the property before all that, uh, you know, if, if you're not the cause of the problem. You inherited it. <laughs> case by case is what Adam said. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, it can be looked at. It, right. it, there, there's, it's not hopeless. You'll, you need to get uh, site-specific determination. Okay. And we had a question in the chat. Has any brownfield sites been identified in New Orleans East? I mean, and then also, I want to add a second to that. Are, off, are those also some of the sites that may be listed as opportunity zones? Or are there kind of compounded pushes for this land to be addressed so you have some more incentives attached to it? There are a lot of brownfields in on our opportunity zones, uh, just by the nature of that. Now, the benefits from that program, I understand, are kind of dwindling now on its peak, but uh, there are still some benefits to developing an opportunity zone. And, and, you know, one of the reasons those zones are the way they are is, is they're not, you know, being used to their most benefit. And there are a lot of brownfields in those areas. A couple of, uh, I mentioned one, which is Gordon Plaza, the super fun site. Um, it was built, there was a apartment building, school, um, elderly care facility, and a whole subdivision built on top of the landfill. Back before we were mentioning, they didn't know, you know exactly how to deal with the chemicals in the soils. Um, and they've had to re relocate all of the people that live in Gordon Plaza. They've torn down several of the buildings. Um, they're in the process of Paying the individuals that have been living there. And it's a 30 years plus year process. Yes. Yeah. Yes. This is the biggest, and it's, it's a nationwide um, story. Um, yeah. And they're moving that forward towards the 40 acre solar farm. Um, so that's one site. Lincoln Beach is also all over the radar. They've done a lot of work and assessment and cleanup activities on Lincoln Beach. Um, there's also 6767 Bundy. Um, we were approached by the Louisiana Chamber. Um, they're looking to address the tax bill that's there, but they want to move forward with the assessments on that building as well. So quite a bit of attention in the list. And then are there smaller sites or is there a website where you can um, see potential brownfields? Like the person asking for the these, those are like large sites, but maybe some smaller ones, or do they just need to go to like the 101, like this could be, and then do an inquiry? They can always inquire, yeah. Get in touch with um, at the city, and there's a lot of assessment dollars that are available. Um, smaller sites are being looked at as well, um, but we don't have any inquiries from the east for smaller sites. But we're always there, you know, to help provide support for any size of site. In order to be eligible for brown to, for, in order for us to be able to spend brownfield grants on a property, it needs to be what EPA calls an eligible brownfield site. The thing is, EPA's definition of what is a brownfield, the bar is very, very, very low. So I would say really anything but like a brand new single family house, we could almost somehow say eh, it's a brownfield. You know, any old commercial building, you know, an abandoned storefront, uh, you know, uh, it doesn't have to be a gas station or a dry cleaner. An old, you know, we have all these buildings with old lead paint, old asbestos, anything, you can make an argument is a brownfield. So folks always say, hey, where's the map of all the brownfield sites? Everywhere you look is a brownfield. Everywhere is a brownfield. Unless it's like, you know, one of those new houses they're building on old, you know, old lots and all the big, you know, huge new houses. Okay, not a brownfield. Everything else is eligible for brownfield. 
and Stephen has a question. He's been um, in and out. So just the availability of the resources to deal with, say, for instance, the example of the dry cleaner mm -hmm. location and the time um, to the process to mitigate the um, the assessment portion yep. is what you all will cover. So what's that average time span? Right now, um, the LWQ is saying three to six months for assessment, um, the first phase one assessment, six to nine months for the phase two assessment if needed, and then continuing on with cleanup activity, depending on what it's found. But those two assessments are what are covered on the targeted brownfield, <clears throat> targeted brownfield. <clears throat> TBA, targeted brownfield assessment. assessments. Yeah. Or the phase one and phase two, and right now they're looking at, and it's they've been pretty much on time, the three to six months, and then the six to nine months, depending on the size. This one might take a little bit longer due to the size, but like a normal site, a normal size site, a smaller site, like a dry cleaner. Yeah. Right and, and for somebody wanting to acquire a property, uh, you know, you don't have to go through the whole process to get your liability, you know, limited. If the phase one is complete, you know. And then you acquire it before the phase two, you know, and all the sampling. If the phase one is done, you've done the necessary step to limit your liability. So it's not like you have to wait for all of them. You can start actually trying to steal them. And the phase one is in three to six months, so there will be some. Um, it, it's a bit more complex. Um, you said a lot, I'm sorry, this is our time when you said that practically anything um, can qualify as a brownfield site, but it's been, well, that the load is very low, uh, the bar is very low. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so then there was also the concern or the, uh, the point of guns. So I guess my main question is, is how can this party be accessed to actually secure sites to turn over into permanent green spaces? So it, it, whichever non, you know, whichever organization was interested in creating that green space, whether it was a local government or whether it was a nonprofit, like Lafitte Greenaway of some sort. Uh, whatever entity or even an individual, whatever entity is going to purchase a piece of property to turn into green space, a great first stop would be the Brownfield program because before, you know, while you're in looking at that property before you make that purchase, we will help you take a very detailed investigation of it to determine what if any environmental concerns exist on that property so that that entity the government, the nonprofit can go into that purchase um, knowing clearly you know, what's going on there. So you would definitely be the first stop if we're trying to get, um, I don't mean to mispronounce it, lead or lead certification um, as far as getting the beginning analysis um, required in order to complete the process or rather start the process. For yes, I think Brownfields would be the, the good first spot for that. Do I say that right, Scott? I don't know much about the lead certification. And some people, okay. I see buildings here, interestingly, people lose their lead certification. Okay. And I feel like it's more due to the maintenance oh, requirements. Yeah, that's what oh, she okay. yeah, So right. if she's doing the lead certification, that's already the acquisition of a building. I so oh, then do okay. the, oh, it's for communities and buildings. It's 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 very durable. So like for instance, um, a nonprofit, a community, a city, a building, a business, everyone can qualify for lead certification. So it's just within um, what industry and how you're going to get it. Mm -hmm. But you have to first start that process to get your certification. Mm -hmm. And to do that, you have to have the beginning assessment to mark the changes that you make. Now, with the maintenance part, you need to get with um, a professional to maintain right. that status. I've seen more of the maintenance and people losing certification than actually in this region than actually those that actually get it certified that 
Yeah, but it's easy to get up on, <laughs> but it's harder to maintain. Right. Um, and so I I know that. And so I was trying to figure out in your question, like, is it easier to maintain if you get assessment of like a rapper or some of these things in it? Like, how can you shore up that certification? Or like, do you think brownfield because they give you a list of steps of how to go about is this like what you do in tandem with those steps well for me like i am totally environmentally based like okay. my whole thing is taking what would be a brownfield site and turning it into a permanently embedded green space okay so for me i'm looking at it from my perspective okay. so i can't necessarily give you that analysis at that point in time because I'm trying to shore up my thing right now. Well, that's right. That was my <laughs> question. Like, is for your question of should you do the brownfield assessment? And they're saying like that's kind of ground one or base level yes. that you should start it. Yes. And your was your question like, do you do it in tandem or you were just kind of like putting a check mark? Oh yeah, I was just on what they were mark. saying. Okay, okay. I was just putting a check okay, mark. Okay. Because, um, as far as like. From what I'm seeing, you know, the only way we're going to make it through with climate change is together, right? So it's building a good network. So the only way we're going to divert waste, which in New Orleans is a major issue, is that we're going to have to network, but we don't have the places for the waste to go or to properly um, manage the waste. Then we're going to have problems, like with our trash collection. We should be composting, but they don't know how to. We don't have a compost pickup. So it's about devising the systems to support the lifestyle shift that we need. And that's where I'm at. So yeah, okay. that's 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 why I keep on saying I'm sorry. I'm no, sorry. you're doing an amen to the choir, and we're like, <laughs> well, that's the question. You're adding a verse to the song. Oh, and, and oh yeah. Good. So sorry. so no, but now like understanding that, and that's kind of more that I think we are shifting more. I think there's federal funding and dollars speaking to the environmental impacts. And I think the Brownfields program is what has a lot of dollars coming now that for people that may not have that lens that you have, like addressing the NIMBYisms that are throughout or not in my backyard, like some of the issues for environmental injustices in New Orleans, this is a great starting space for people. I have a question in the chat around um, New Orleans East. Someone is asking about a three to four mile um, location on Almanaster Ave, east of the Industrial Canal, but they're not sure just about all of the area is a brownfield. But if a site of this area was considered for development, would the cost of brownfield be the benefits for, let's say, developing as a green space? That's a very long question. Um, you have, that's kind of hard to determine. So if for me. If I have a part of a field that's a brown field and part of it's not, would you all address the part that would be considered a brown field part of that land? It would all of it would be assessed. Okay. Yeah. So I guess it's kind of confusing. The question is a little bit confusing because um, the assessment would cover the entire area. So okay. whether or not some portions have contamination, some portions don't have contamination, um, it would all be assessed. And then the phase two would identify exactly where those specific contaminations um, are. And then the cleanup and remediation activity would, but it would, whatever space there is, the assessment would cover the entire area to make sure that if there's little pockets of contamination, that's why the phase two, they do a lot of sampling so they know exactly where the, the contamination is. And then they're talking about the development, which is, another side so once it's addressed you get your 2,000 pages saying you're good to go then that's the whole nother pro forma or price assessment you have to do with your development to see if it is indeed quote unquote exceeding the benefits to turn into a green space but your development option also will determine the cleanup that's necessary in the parking lot don't have to clean up as much as the daycare. I mean, so your your future use gets determined, you know, and that will determine your cleanup and the cost associated with that one too. So it kind of all works. So if they're thinking about turning into like a park or a splash pad or something like that for the community, that's oh well, yeah. Once you know, once the we assess the site and clean it up or don't or decide it doesn't need cleanup, like we're done. We kind of walk away. 
whatever the redevelopment is after that is 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 uh is kind of our, out of our out of my ballpark. Same. The economic development of you know turning a brownfield into a green space. I, I mean, the brownfields assessment and most of the cleanup activity will be you know, pro bono. So the cost of right. effectiveness there is yeah we don't need crazy. money back we right don't even have like a do you all put like do you all put nice grass on it after you finish oh, no. digging we don't do nothing okay we okay. give we give you the front clean side. land okay. <laughs> clean land and then I have we to take a picture okay and then clean land come back to the ribbon cutting okay so just prepping redevelopment do we have any final closing questions. Any final thoughts from our panel? Any um, burning thoughts that you may not have been able to present during your presentation segment that will be on YouTube for those that were able or not able to come for the full part of the session, the webinar? Um, there will be a community meeting for the NSA building in September. So stay tuned on City Planning Commission's website and for people who are interested in what's going on with the site and the process. Um, it'll be in the bywater to be determined location. And do we say by water or knife water? People in the chat, let me know. I don't want to know what I, I'm butcher up people's uh, neighborhoods and how they claim it's, not, it's on the border. It's on the border. Okay. Okay. It's okay. okay. technically in the by water, but that's for the lower nine. We, we do have some a lot of lower nine representation in here, so I don't want to step on any toes. Being not from here, I'm like, okay, 273 neighborhoods got it. Now, when were they created? How do I call them? <laughs> um, how do they call you all? Are you all okay with me placing your emails in the chat or sending it so they can? I My stuff's on the slide for okay. the presentation. So, okay. yeah, and you feel free to share. So, I'll put that in the chat now and then share. I have a copy of it. I can give to our person that came in first. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, Send through the chat and through email for those that were in attendance. I know I see some iPhones, so hold on the line so that I can put it in the chat in real time so that you all, um, I don't have your name, so I just want to make sure you all put that information as well. And just for, I'm not a betting person, um, I don't hedge my bets, but with the shift of the temperature, the uh, governmental system policies. I want to know from each one of our panelists, where do you think we should be in our ideal space 10 years from now? And then where do you think is the most shining star in that 10 year span? Thank you, Don. I got you. Anyone can, one more time. So, in your crystal ball in the next 10 years, based on all the factors that we have, what is one shining star element in addressing and mitigating environmental waste issues that you see evolving even and growing more than we are now that people may not be taking advantage of? I know we're highlighting brownfields, but I know the brownfields to brightfields is one that's on my radar as people are grabbing land and space and mixed use, but for you all, what is that crystal ball, perfect 10 year place that we'll be in? Thinking only positively, uh, like no <laughs> negative environmental pieces, but just the positives that people can maybe take away and even start working on today. I would say alternative energy, the production of alternative energies through um, the Bright Fields program and having if a storm does come through, having enough energy provided by those resources to be able to have just regular water and lights and come back into an area that instead of having no power for a number of weeks or months, you can use the power that is created from former contaminated land. That would be an amazing situation. And I think it's moving that way pretty quickly. Uh, I wish I'm, I'm I'm really encouraged by all the um, you know all I'm hearing about how well Louisiana Southeast Louisiana how well positioned we are to take advantage of uh, you know offshore wind and uh, renewables as Carrie was talking about I think Louisiana and our region is really well positioned to take advantage of um, 
the push into transitioning more into green energy. I think it's going to be hopefully great for our economy. Um, we see um, a lot of industry popping up here in New Orleans or over on the West Bank, uh, you know, in our suburbs. And, you know, all the probably know St. Bernard is going gangbusters, uh, St. Tammany Parish, lots of great new development. So I think crystal ball, fingers crossed, that we are pointed very well in the, in the right direction, um, I, hopefully for the next few years. I'm hopeful that the, uh, the extra money that's coming in now to Brownfields redevelopment will will help get a lot of the properties that have sat for a long time unaddressed that are unused back to some productive reuse. And, and with that, people will be considering alternative energy, other other things in the building itself uh, to be more resilient. Um, and, and so, you know, going forward, um, you know, as these, these places are redeveloped, they can be more long lasting. Yeah. The just the the the, the um Miss Frizzle close out to it for the <laughs> for the, the magic school bus. He just every, anything is possible if you just believe and think of it and we have a space where there's so many opportunities and like you're saying the funding and the dollars now. So really pulling in our economic development districts, our nonprofits, our communities, our individuals that are keen on being subject matter experts and really know how to address and support some of these projects, I think is a great start. We know now what a brownfield is. I, this is New Orleans East. Um, so I'm like, as we're looking at some potential of how people do um, address some of the environmental issues or some of the opportunity zones and grow for parks, rec, um, as you see here, or for uh, green space, solar energy. So just thank you all for our panel for coming during this pre-holiday, pre-essence, end of pride, hot Wednesday, <laughs> global warming Wednesday. But if we, <laughs> if, and this uh, session will be available online. If you have any chat questions that you didn't uh, get to ask, I have placed the speaker's emails in the chat, as well as Valerie's email is in the chat, and I am placing my email in the chat. And those that were on the event right, you all will be able to access the link and the information as well there. So thank you all so much for coming and attending our second quarter session and have a great day. Clap fingers. Thanks. Thank you all. Um, I, I have to apologize because I